Okay, well, recall, I believe when we left off, we were talking about the, uh, uh, we were talking about maximum likelihood estimation in the context of a, uh, uh, analyzing some binary categorical data. Uh, and I believe this was the last slide we left off with. Uh, well, since then, I've actually reordered the slides a bit, and, uh, and my apologies for, for that as you go uh, looking through your own slide deck, uh, as well as adding a few slides. I, I will try and remember to post those as soon as I can after the class so that you have all the ones we're looking at in the same order. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and, and get into it. Uh, let's see, a couple of things here. Okay, so I'll post those. Um, during our last set, at the end of the last session, it became evident that uh, we had actually mistakenly posted uh, that Bayesian, uh, that knowledge of uh, Bayesian analysis using wind bugs was a, was desirable, but not a, a firm prerequisite. Uh, so you should have seen an email indicating that uh, if you do need that additional background about uh, Bayesian analysis and use of wind bugs, we've offered free access to our, an independent study version of a um, of our of a basic um, Bayesian analysis course that we've done in the past. Uh, so it's called MI two hundred IS. So. Uh, some of you have already indicated a desire to uh, to have access to those materials. If there are others who have yet to indicate that they need that, please uh, please respond to Joe and let him know that you need access to that. Uh, but another consequence of that fact is I <coughs> excuse me decided to include a, just a small number of slides on the very basics. Of, uh, of Bayesian inference here as a, as a starting point for today. Uh, so we're now making the transition from maximum likelihood estimation to Bayesian, uh, Bayesian analysis. And, and what we'll find is that some of the elements carry across. So the likelihood uh, that we were maximizing in order to estimate parameters in the maximum likelihood method uh, still plays a role in this, but a, but a somewhat different role. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a, a quick, quick walk through some of the basics of, of Bayesian inference. So let's start out just by uh, talking a bit about Bayes' rule. Uh, that's really the basis for inference about our model parameters uh, in the Bayesian analysis. And as before, I will use theta to represent a vector of, of model parameters. Uh, and y is going to represent data. Uh, so Bayes' rule is the basis for inference about those model parameters given data, uh, plus uh, also given any prior knowledge you may have about the model parameters. And that prior knowledge is going to be represented in the form of this quantity here, p of theta. Uh, so we can think of that, so that's now a also a probability function, probability density or function or a probability function that represents the prior knowledge. And the degree of spread of that distribution is essentially a statement of your degree of certainty or uncertainty in what the, value, what the values of the parameters are before, you have, uh, before you've seen this new data. Uh, now, and so the way we're going to apply Bayes' rule in the context of Bayesian inference uh, is we show down here. Uh, so here we introduce again our, the, some terminology, this P of theta, uh, we commonly call the prior distribution. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to be able to make inferences about our parameter uh, after we've seen the data, other data Y. And, and that's now going to be described in terms of this thing we call a posterior distribution, which we've written here as P of theta given Y. So the, this resulting distribution is supposed to describe our knowledge about the values of those parameters after having observed uh, that data uh, represented by Y here. Uh, so we can take the underlying definition for conditional distributions uh, and turn that around to construct Bayes' rule, which is what we've got here, where we can say 
uh, the numerator here you can see is the product of the posterior distribution and this P of Y given theta is nothing more than the likelihood that we've already talked about in the context of the maximum likelihood method. And finally that's divided by some sort of a normalization constant so that this, this thing here uh, integrates to 1 uh, so that the, our posterior distribution actually has the properties of a probability distribution. Uh, on the right hand side this is just taking this one step further by replacing this P of Y by another way of expressing it which is to take your uh, your likelihood function the P of Y given theta uh, and you multiply that by again the prior and integrate that over all possible values of theta and that then becomes this your marginal distribution of Y. Uh, but at one point you can see on the right hand side that is if you know both the, your prior and your and your likelihood that means you can you can construct uh, the the posterior the this density function here for the posterior distribution uh, and often the way you'll see Bayes rule written is instead of writing out the whole mess here is it'll be written out in terms of a proportionality relationship by saying that the posterior distribution is proportional to the product of the prior distribution and the likelihood. So that's, that's going to be serve then as the foundation uh, for the Bayesian analysis approach as we're talking about. Uh, let's take that relationship now and turn it into a, a data analysis process or an inference process. That's what we're talking about here, and I've tried to break this down as a, as a set of steps uh, that you would do in general when doing a Bayesian modeling uh, and inference. So one of the things that you need to do is you would need to uh, construct or assess a prior distribution, our P of theta. Uh, now as we're doing this, one of the core differences here between this and a typical frequentist method uh, in here is that theta is no longer viewed as a as a scalar value or as a single value. It's now being viewed as a random variable, something which can take on a range of variables with with a range of probabilities uh, as characterized by a probability distribution. So again, so theta is now being viewed as a uh, as a set of random variables. Uh, the, in the case of a prior distribution, uh, it can be argued that the process of constructing one is subjective uh, and the degree of subjectivity varies from, uh, from one case to another because in, you know, one possibility is one might construct a prior distribution just based on expert opinion or maybe even non-expert opinion, uh, making it particularly subjective. Uh, there are also some approaches for constructing a prior distribution based upon, uh, still based upon observed data uh, and in a way that one could argue is more objective than using expert opinion, but, you know, but there's still usually an element of subjectivity in uh, in the choice of that data and in deciding to what degree that data is relevant to the problem at hand. Uh, as I say here, ideally you would like to base estimation of this uh, prior distribution on all your available evidence and knowledge, uh, perhaps in some contexts maybe just belief. Um, uh, but then in other cases where you may wish to deliberately select a non-informative or weakly informative prior distribution uh, because we'd like the, the new data to tell most of the story in some instances. Uh, but the, these choices are very much up to the, uh, you know, up to the analyst and whoever that, you know, and whoever the uh, stakeholders are in the analysis. Uh, the, the names I give here, by the way, are a list of uh, different, some different types of, uh, of weakly informative or non-informative priors uh, that you'll sometimes see in the, particularly in the statistical literature, but you see re re names like a reference prior, or vague prior, or improper prior. But we're not going to go into those in detail right now. So, but anyway, the first step here then is you, we need to construct a prior distribution relevant to the problem. 
then we need to construct a model for the data conditioned on the model parameters. And of course, that is nothing more than the thing we've been talking about already, namely the likelihood function. Uh, then once we have those two pieces, it's possible then to calculate a posterior distribution. Uh, and it's that posterior distribution of those parameters that we then use for inferences regarding the parameters of our model. Uh, another thing you can do is if you've got your posterior distribution of the parameters, you can also construct posterior distributions for, uh, for potential future observations. Uh, now what we're talking about is something that's commonly termed a posterior predictive distribution. As you can see I've written that out as, as, the, as a probability distribution describing new data given old data uh, in effect. Uh, and I would use that then for inferences regarding future predictions, you know, future observations. In other words, for making predictions uh, and predictions that can make clear statements about the probability of observing various different outcomes in the future. Uh, and this equation here is just showing how one can construct that given the posterior distribution and your likelihood function. Uh, you can use that to construct this uh, posterior predictive distribution. Okay, so that's, that's about as far as I was planning on going in a review here. Uh, again, if you do need more background, uh, maybe one thing I should do is point you to some, both some, reference, some references. Uh, of course, the one we've already talked about, which is the... Uh, which is the basic Bayesian course we offer, that uh, MI200IS course, uh, which you can get access to. Uh, the other thing I can point to is actually take you, show you some references here. They're actually near the end of the uh, slide deck. Let me actually scroll quickly down there. Let's see, that is, I guess it doesn't show up here, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Okay, uh, my favorite uh, by far in terms of getting up to speed on Bayesian methods uh, is the book by Gelman et al. Gelman, Carl, and Stern, and Rubin. Uh, it, I find it is for, for non-statisticians, it's not a, you know, it's not a walk in the park, but it's also, but uh, on the other hand, it's not too bad. It's, and it very much has a modeling orientation. Uh, in a way that I think should appeal reasonably well to, to non-statisticians as long as you have the core uh, probability concepts down. Uh, another one that's at about the same level but is maybe a little more uh, geared towards statisticians in my mind is Carlin and Lewis uh, in there. Uh, the uh, Berger book here I list mainly because of its treatment of uh, statistical decision theory uh, mostly in a Bayesian framework, so it's it's not so much covering the basics we're talking about. Although they do have a, it does actually have a fairly decent introductory Bayesian analysis section too. Um, the uh, the last one here, uh, David Spiegel, Halter, Abrams, and Miles, uh, is a, is a nice little collection uh, that describes use of Bayesian approaches in in various contexts, in particularly clinical trials. Uh, that might be of interest to you. Um, so those are uh, core set. Oh, I see I actually put this article in the wrong place. We'll talk about that one later. Let me see if I put the one I had in mind there somewhere else. Let me take a quick look. I didn't. Okay, I'll try and reconcile, uh, correct that in a later one. The article I was actually looking for was a different one by David Lunn. Uh, David Lunn has a, uh, a good uh, sort of overview of wind bugs. Uh, it's an article, it's not so much an article on how to use it, but it gives you some I a better idea of what some of the underlying uh, the underlying methods are inside wind bugs on how it functions. Um, and I know David Lunn was one of the authors, I believe, 
uh, let's see, Andrew Thomas, David Spiegelhalter, Nikki Best would have all been co-authors on it all. So anyway, I'll try and remember to correct that um, in a future release of this. Okay, let's head on back. Let's see. Okay, now let's talk more specifically about applying this Bayesian paradigm to odd type data. Uh, and to start with, let's, as an example, let me start with an example that we did before uh, in the maximum likelihood context. Uh, so it was a linear logistic regression example. Uh, where we would observe whether or not an adverse event occurred in each of a hundred patients. Uh, and recall we use it was a, again it was linear logistic regression with a, just a fairly simple one where we had the, the logit of our probability of an adverse event uh, was a described by a straight line function of dose. So we've got our intercept plus slope times dose uh, in here. Uh, now, in the way we're going to do this, the, the likelihood function is exactly the same as, as it was before in the maximum likelihood case, but we also need to specify a prior distribution for our model parameters, specifically for theta 1 and theta 2. Uh, and the resulting expression then for our posterior distribution is shown down here. So we're going to calculate the uh, posterior distribution for theta given our observed data and our and our doses uh, and so we take our likelihood the p of y given theta and our covariates here dose which is our only covariate multiplied by uh, by the posterior distribution for theta and here I've just written it out explicitly as a likelihood over here just so that you see the but the function here on the right, this L of theta, given these two things, is, is exactly the same function as it is on the left here, where I wrote it as P is Y observed uh, given theta. Uh, then that, in turn, is proportional to the product of the individual uh, uh, likelihoods multiplied by the prior distribution uh, on this side. Uh, and and we could also we also recall that we're dealing with something where we can describe this likelihood in terms of the uh, Bernoulli relation. I'm sorry, in terms of yeah, in terms of a Bernoulli relationship here. So you can see I've written that out again. So we've got our probability raised to uh, y of xi times one minus the probability of one minus y of xi, and which one of these ends up dominating depends upon whether y is a zero or a one. But again, it's all multiplied by, uh, by our p of theta, by our, in other words, our prior distribution. So notice that if you went back and looked at the, uh, uh, the previous maximum likelihood example where we wrote everything in terms of likelihoods, uh, the right-hand side here would all look the same except now we've added this p of theta to each component. So we've written out the basic form. Now we, have, we do need to uh, specify a prior distribution, which again may be based upon some knowledge or belief we have, uh, or, uh, or again, we may deliberately choose a, a, a weakly informative prior. In this case, I'm saying, well, let's suppose we actually do have some prior information about the value of theta, which I seem to have lost in the sentence there. Uh, and we choose to represent that knowledge as a bivariate normal distribution, uh, in this case with relatively large variances and no correlation. Uh, so I've written that here, and I see I made another typo here. This should actually be a, not a proportional to, but a, a little squiggle symbol here uh, to indicate that theta is distributed normal with some mean mu and some variance matrix uh, sigma here. Uh, and in particular, we're gonna, I'm going to pick a couple of numbers here. So I'm going to say, okay, let's have, let's, uh, our prior is that we believe 
the uh, our distribution is centered around minus one for the intercept and 0.2 for the slope. Uh, and we've got again our our sigma here. So we've got in this case I'm assuming there's no correlation, and I've got standard deviations of one and 0.2. So basically we've got like 100% you know, CVs on this. And what I'm doing is if you actually run the numbers and uh, and calculate the the density function, uh, it, what you get are pictures like this. So what I'm looking at here, uh, and I'm what I'm doing is I'm going to compare the left-hand plots are the prior distribution, and the right-hand plots are the posterior distribution. So conceptually, you would, the prior represents our state of knowledge before having observed the data, and the posterior represents our state of knowledge after having observed it. Uh, and you can see in our prior, uh, here the theta 1, recall, is the intercept, theta 2 is the slope. Uh, and you can see, you know, you can see the shape here. But in particular, what we want to do is compare when we take a look at the posterior. Notice that uh, on the posterior, it looks like maybe we've learned something because this is steeper. You'll notice that the axes cover a narrower range of values. On here, perhaps I should have used the same one so it would be more evident to see that. Uh, and you can see the same thing in a contour plot here. Again, you can see the range of values has has shrunk on the two axes. Another thing is, is we start out with an uncorrelated relationship here, and you can see a correlation in the estimates uh, over here, going by this sort of slanted shape uh, that you observe on the right. Uh, something that maybe makes the uh, the difference between posterior, prior and posterior a little clearer is if we take a look at the marginal distributions uh, for the two parameters. Again, our, our intercept on the on the left and our slope on the right. Uh, I've plotted the prior, the marginal prior distributions in red, so you can see those, and then compare that to the posterior marginal distributions in blue. And you can see that, uh, well, if we look over here on the, uh, let's see, the intercept, you can see the, the, rain, the, the value is, is centered eh, not too far away from where it was in the prior, uh, just a bit to the left. Uh, but what's probably more striking is that it's a, it's a narrower, uh, narrower spread in this, indicating that uh, it appears that we've learned something by adding new data compared to our prior. Uh, on the case of the slope, it's sort of both ways. It's narrowed, but in addition, we've shifted quite a bit to the left, suggesting that uh, the data has, has told us that maybe our, our prior was not entirely consistent with, uh, uh, with the truth in this case. Let's see, where was I going to go? Okay, so. So that's just to give you the, a quick flavor uh, of the process then of a Bayesian analysis. Again, they just remind you what we're doing when we make inferences ba about the parameters in, in this case. We're no longer just picking a point estimate uh, and then trying as a second step to construct uh, some estimate of our uncertainty in that. The very process of doing the Bayesian analysis and constructing a posterior distribution gives us both types of information in one go. So we, we get a posterior distribution, which as a whole represents our estimate of that parameter. Uh, we can certainly summarize that posterior in terms of things like a mean or median, uh, and in terms of uh, what are commonly termed credible intervals to describe probable ranges. So for example, you might construct a 95% uh, credible interval by taking the two and a half and the ninety-seven and a half percentile uh, of this distribution that you see. Okay, let's um, get even more concrete now and start talking about what's involved in actually doing such an analysis. Uh, using the kinds of tools that we're going to be talking about in the course, particularly uh, the use of R and WinBugs for doing this. And let's actually uh, walk through uh, an example of doing that.
Okay, so we're actually going to model some binary data. Again, it's going to be logistic regression. Uh, so this is just reminding you of what that is. So logistic regression refers to fitting binary data with models that have a form that we see here, where we've got the logit of probability equals some function of our covariates and our model parameters. Uh, so in the, P is usually going to then represent the probability that some event occurs, you know, like for instance those adverse events we were just modeling in the previous case, and X is a vector of covariance. Okay, so we're going to take a get more specific. Uh, let's suppose that we want to model the incidence of a potentially dose-limiting adverse event as a function of dose in order to support dose selection. Again, much like the example before, and I guess I should mention the header here. So what we're going to be talking about is if you have individual binary data, so let's say you've got a bunch of individual patients, you've got each patient has one data point which is either a, a one or a zero basically, it's binary. Uh, and we're going to be using a Bernoulli model to describe that. Uh, for our example, the data is going to consist of individual patient results from a study design where it was a parallel dose finding study, 100 patients per dose arm. Uh, the treatment arms uh, were in different doses, 5, 10, 20, and 40 milligrams. And we've got some potential covariates here, in this case age, weight, and gender. And this is a, just some exploratory analysis of, the, of that data. Uh, so up on top here you can see we're looking at the, well let's see, for all the plots the y-axis is the fraction of patients with an adverse event. Uh, in the one here we're looking at that as a function of dose and we can see, you can actually ignore most of the curve here if you just look at the points, uh, it's apparent that there is some increase in the incidence of adverse events. Uh, as the uh, as the dose goes up, uh, this is just sort of a smoothing function with a confidence interval spread around it. Uh, and oh, and I guess I should mention the, I've made separate plots here for male and female here. So it's pretty evident that there's some sort of dose response, and we'd like to characterize that. I've also made plots here of fraction of patients with the adverse event versus age. Uh, and weight on the right hand side and split that out by dose group. Uh, and you can see in this case, uh, now we're plotting the individual data so they're all either zeros or ones. Uh, the only reason there's any uh, noise down there is just some added jitter to, so to, to allow you to visualize the data a little bit better. Uh, and then a smooth that's put through here to try and identify any apparent trend as we look at this, there's nothing real obvious in this. There's maybe a, a hint of increase with age, but it's, it's ambiguous. Uh, similarly, in the case of, um, uh, of body weight, there's nothing that really jumps out at us here. Um, yeah, who knows, there might be a hint of a decline that's suggested in the 40 milligram group, but the others don't look like there's much going on. So we're going to look at that a little deeper uh, using our analysis. So. Uh, so let's propose a model at the outset. We're going to use a linear logistic regression model uh, for our adverse event occurrence as a function of dose, gender, age, and weight. Uh, the way we write, I'm writing out the model. Uh, again, I'm using sort of statistics conventions for writing these. Uh, as you can see where I say the uh, AE here, which will be described as a 1 if the adverse event occurs and 0 otherwise, will describe as a Bernoulli distribution, which has one parameter, namely the probability of that adverse event occurring, and there would be a separate value of that for each patient. So I represents a patient. Uh, then we've got our core model in here for that probability is going to be the logit of that probability is going to be an intercept plus uh, we've got our theta 2 times dose. Then I've got uh, theta 3 times the uh, centered value of age. Same thing for weight. Theta, so we've got our theta 4 times weight minus 70 kilograms. And then another term here for gender. So theta 5 times gender. And I don't remember in this whether male was 1 or female was 1, but it's a 1 and a 0 in this case. Um, 
And then in this case, I'm going to use very weakly informative priors. So our, our theta i's, theta 1 through theta 5, uh, I'll just use priors that are normal centered at zero with, uh, uh, with a variance of a million, in other words, a, a standard deviation of a thousand, which in this context is a pretty uninformative uh, value, a pretty flat prior. So we're going to take that uh, model as I've written it there and write it out. Whoops. No, it wasn't. Oh, I want to go there, but not yet. I'm going to take this and translate this into a uh, into a Winbugs model. Uh, fortunately, uh, Winbugs, uh, the Winbugs model specification language is actually pretty close to what you're looking at here in terms of the way you write it. So let me go to that. Um, so just remind you, uh, assuming you've had the background in Winbugs, uh, for any model, uh, you the entire model is enclosed uh, in a in a range here where you start out with the word model and then you have a set of brackets that enclose, uh, enclose the, the model code. Uh, and so we're going to be to go over all the values of data, all of our individuals here, which are indexed by i, we use what looks like a for loop. You say for i and 1 to n obs, and this n obs for the number of observations, that's something you define in your data set. On the first statement here, uh, I've written out the likelihood. So this statement is the same as the, the one we had in the previous page, uh, essentially. So I've got AE for the ith individual here is distributed, and again you use the squiggle symbol here. Uh, tilde, I guess that is, uh, and that's going to be Bernoulli distributed, and in WinBugs the Bernoulli distribution is written as D burn. In general, all the distributions in WinBugs begin with a D, and that has one parameter, namely a probability value, uh, and I just called it P dot AE, and again that's going to be different for each individual. And here I'm just reminding us, putting a comment here, uh, that this represents our likelihood. So comments are delimited using, indicated by just using a, a hash symbol. Actually, one hash is, is sufficient to, to indicate that it's a, um, it's a comment. Um, so that's our, the basic component of our likelihood. And then we define our, our, our PAE here, our probability of an adverse event. And you can see that here where I've got logit of PAE. Uh, is, and I, you use something that's more akin to our conventions, you use the sort of a left-handed arrow, which is made up of a less than symbol and a dash. Uh, and that, so our logit of PAE equals our theta 1 plus theta 2 times dose plus theta 3 times age minus 40, theta 4 times weight minus 70, and theta 5 times gender. So this is a <laughs> Winbug's version again of the statement that we had, the, the equation that I showed on the previous slide. And at that point we've got our, our core model. Now there are components here that, that, let's see, other things I should mention. Notice that I've put a function name on the left hand side of this equation, uh, which is somewhat atypical for most, you know, most programming languages. Uh, but keep in mind, this is not a programming language, this is a model specification language. Uh, and WinBugs does allow certain functions to appear on the left-hand side. It's a fairly limited set. I believe it's limited to log, logit, uh, and, um, oh, what is it called? Complementary log, log. Uh, at least those are the three that I mentioned, remember off the top of my head. Uh, it's either only those or maybe those plus one more. Uh, that you can do that. Other functions can only be on the right-hand side of a relationship. Uh, so that's your core, and then we also have to specify the prior distribution, and that appears down here. Uh, that's outside this loop that goes over the individuals, because this prior applies to all of the individuals. Uh, and so you can see now, because in this case I, I use the same prior for all of the thetas, I was able to put it in a loop. I could have alternatively just put theta 1 gets d norm so and so for each one, but 
I, since I'm using the same prior, this was kind of a shorthand. Uh, notice and recall I said that our theta i's then had priors that were normal 0, 10 to the 6th. Now there, when I said that, I was using the more standard convention of describing the normal distribution in terms of a mean and a variance. But when bugs uses a different convention, they specify it in terms of a mean and a precision. And a precision is nothing more than the reciprocal of a variance. So instead of 10 to the 6th, we've got 10 to the minus 6th in here. And finally, there's one other state. Now, by the way, what I've just told you about is enough to fit the model and get the posterior distributions of the parameters. But often we would like to get posterior predictions of, uh, of, you know, of possible future observations uh, for various reasons, either because we actually want to make some predictions about something else, and it's also very useful for, as part of the model diagnostics. And that's what's going on with this additional statement here. Whoops, go back up uh, where you see ae.pred uh, is Bernoulli PAE. Notice that this, uh, the right-hand side of this is identical to the likelihood function. And the only reason, uh, the only way that Winbugs knows that one is a prediction and the other one is a likelihood is because this value here, the AE, uh, AEIs here, are data that are up here in the data set, whereas the AE preds, there's no corresponding data. So, so in that case, it will do a forward simulation uh, as opposed to treating this, uh, this equation as a likelihood. Let's see. Now, I think the next slide actually shows results. Rather than do that, I'd like to take the remainder of our time uh, to actually walk through the process of applying this on the um, on our uh, on the uh, compute server. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, you've actually got this example uh, in your uh, in your information also. But let me go ahead and. Uh, Pull up a web browser. Let's, let's see, did I end up putting it up here or not? Oh, brain death. Actually, it wasn't a web browser, is it? I want to use the uh, remote desktop connection. Okay, there we go. So I'll go ahead and connect up to that. By the way, I notice that things are kind of silent out there. Feel free to ask any questions along the way here, and I'll try and keep an eye out for them. Uh, okay, so I've fired that up, so we're back in that. And if you haven't already tried to get on to the, um, onto the compute server, I, uh, please do so uh, if you plan on using that, that facility. So we're sure that you're able to get on there and uh, get functioning. Let me go ahead and, well, actually, let's first of all, let's go full screen so everybody can see what's going on. Uh, let's pull up a Explorer window. Okay. Uh, okay, that's not what I wanted to do. Go down, users, build G. Am I 255? There we go. Okay, where I'm going here is in this directory here, binary example. Uh, so that corresponds to the example we're just talking about in the slides. Okay, and you'll see uh, a few different slide or a few different files here. You can see uh, this binary example dot text and binary example dot r and the ae data dot csv. Uh, well, the ae data dot csv is nothing more than the uh, data we were just looking at uh, in the uh, uh, for this example. Uh, actually, do I have? realize I don't think I've got a spreadsheet. Oh, I've got open office. Maybe we can look at it with that. Let's see. Just to give you a visualization of the data here.
Well, while I'm waiting for that to open the spreadsheet, uh, so the way we're going to run this is, well, first of all, the binary example.txt is a text file containing the WinBugs model. Uh, so in other words, it's the same model we were just looking at in the slide. Uh, and binary example.r is an R script that we use, that it will be using for uh, to manage the data, basically get the data in a format suitable for WinBugs. Uh, it then launches WinBugs, uh, WinBugs runs, and then when WinBugs is done, the data is returned in return to R, uh, and then we can use R for things like making diagnostic plots and and any uh, and summarizing our parameter estimates and so on. Okay, let's make sure Open Office isn't hidden behind. It is okay. We're waiting for nothing. Oh, I don't want to. Are well, you going to let me skip it? Or maybe not. Okay, will it let me just pretend I'm nobody? Okay, there we go. Uh, There we go. Okay, I just wanted to give you a visualization of the data so you can see we've got, uh, you know, it's indicated we've got subject, weight, age, gender, dose. Uh, well, ignore the p.ae, that's a derived quantity. The ae is the actual, the, the data we're interested in. And if you go scrolling down, you'll see that that last column is nothing but ones and zeros. Uh, I think the lowest doses are in the first part, so they tend to be mostly zeros. And as you go up further and further, you see, whoops, more and more ones as you get to the to the higher doses. Sorry, I probably scrolled too fast for the web to catch up there. Uh, so in the data, we're actually only going to be using weight, age, gender, dose, and AE. Those are the only columns we're actually going to be uh, making use of. Okay, so let's go ahead and take, first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, uh, our model so you really see that it's equivalent to the one we were, we're using. Let me go ahead and open that. And I'm going to make me go through all that again. Okay. Yeah, by default, uh, WinBugs assumes that you're using this uh, ODC uh, extension on here, which is a particular format unique to uh, uh, to WinBugs here. But we're going, we want a text file, so we'll do that. And you can see that's now there, binary example, and we open that up, and you can see that's actually the same as we were just looking at in the slide. So that's the model we're working with. Let's actually go ahead and close that. That was just illustrating what it looked like from within WinBugs. Let's go ahead and open up R. Okay, and again, we got to go get our script that we're going to work with. I need to figure out how to make this the default directory here. Okay, so we got our binary example.r. Let's open that up. Okay, um, take some time here to orient you to, to the script I've got here. Uh, much of the script uh, that you'll see here is in a, it's a structure that you'll be seeing over and over again uh, in the various examples, and it'll be the basis for constructing and doing the hands on exercises uh, for you. And, and a, lot of pe a lot of sections of it. Uh, sort of fall under the heading of boilerplate. And so there's a lot of bits you don't necessarily need to change uh, as part of this. Now one of the key things that you will change when you start constructing your own models would be, for instance, right on top 
is notice here I define a model name which would be the root name of the various files that are associated with the, a particular model. In our case that's the binary example uh, name here. So you got binary example and keep in mind that um, that some of the programs that you're working with here are case sensitive so you do need to keep that in mind. Uh, so it's binary example. Uh, some of this stuff down here I would treat this section, this bit of nonsense is boilerplate to make sure that um, that it's looking for the files in the right place. Uh, so I recommend you don't touch that <laughs> or you're bound to break something on that. Um, down here we specify whoops, uh, the directory where the course content is which in our case is MI255 and with the, to get the full path name I, this, this uh, home directory is, which is defined up here is, is, is added to the MI255 to get the full path. I have the example directory is constructed using a combination of the course directory and our model name. Again in our case the model name being binary example. Uh, this bit of stuff for the bugs directory here, again I would recommend that you leave that alone. Uh, I believe that should work for you. By the way, if these don't work for you, for example, the one thing I had a question mark on is whether this node name would always stay constant for everybody. Uh, if for some reason you run into a problem uh, at that level, let me know. Uh, some of this stuff, unless you're working on something like a Macintosh or in a Linux environment, you can ignore these references to Wine. Uh, they, if you're working in Windows, they don't do anything. You can ignore them. If you're working in a uh, Unix flavor environment, you may have to change this path name. Uh, then it sets the working directory uh, to the one where the, our example is. It's pulling in some libraries that we're going to use. Uh, the ones maybe of most interest to us right now would be R to WinBugs. That one is a, an R package uh, that provides tools for working with WinBugs from R. Uh, Coda is another set that's kind of interrelated with that, uh, that in particular is useful for uh, reading in and analyzing the, uh, the results of WinBugs. Uh, Lattice is some plotting and LocFit is a little thing that I used for doing some of the exploratory plots. Uh, pulling in a couple of files that have a few handy dandy functions in them here, Bugs Tools and Beagle SP Utilities. Uh, let's see, uh, here uh, finally to some business here. Uh, here we're pulling in that data set. So it's pulling in that CSV file. Uh, there's a section here that's creating uh, the, that set of exploratory plots I showed you with the smooths through the binary data is, is what's going on there. So feel free to explore that if you want. I won't go through that in detail here. Let's scroll down to the business end related to the wind bugs itself. Okay, here we go. So here uh, is where the, a list containing the bugs data is created and that's the form that we're going to be passing uh, to WinBugs via the R to WinBugs function. Uh, so you can see we're pulling in, uh, we create this number of observations, that nobs value I mentioned before and that's simply the number of rows in the data set and we pull in the various columns we needed, dose, age, weight, gender, and AE. In other words, the indicator for adverse events. Uh, then we need to construct initial estimates uh, for this and again don't confuse initial estimates with prior distributions. They're, they're definitely two different things uh, in here. Initial estimates is just a place for the, uh, for the MCMC algorithm to start in terms of the calculations uh, and they can influence how well the convergence occurs, uh, how quickly it occurs and maybe even whether or not it occurs. Uh, but it does not play the same role as the uh, uh, as a prior distribution uh, in terms of the final result. Actually, let me get rid. Of, let 
move that one down so we can see it better. Okay, so what's going on here is the easiest way to specify a, a initial estimates when working with the R to win bugs functions is to specify it in terms of a function. So, so there, there's actually two approaches you can use. One, you can specify them as a list of lists where each sublist is a set of initial estimates for a particular MCMC chain or you can pass a, pass a function in that, will, that may by some means result in different initial estimates for each, each time a new MCMC chain is started. Uh, and that's what I'm using here. And the way I keep it from giving the same values every time is I use some random number uh, generation here. So in particular, you can see here theta my initial estimates for theta I'm generating using a normal distribution uh, where you can see the means are some particular value but I also put in some uh, some standard deviations here and that will generate a different set of initial estimates for each one of the MCMC chains which is a good thing to do as a convergence diagnostic. Uh, then in the next step down here is a little bit more bookkeeping where I'm telling it, okay, what parameters in the model do I actually want to do things like uh, history plots and density plots, things like that, uh, as well as summarizing a table. And then what other random variables might I still want to monitor and use for other purposes, uh, like maybe predicted values. Uh, and that's what's going on here. I put in the uh, probabilities here and of course there's you know there are several hundred of those one for each individual patient here and also the predicted values of the AEs uh, so I, I get a set of posterior predictions that way and I can use those for diagnostic purposes uh, and then the last two lines here just some boilerplate to construct these uh, the values that I want to pass to the bugs function uh, and then finally, we're specifying how many MCMC chains do I want. Uh, and by the way, I apologize to those who haven't had the background in wind bugs yet because the, the term MCMC chains might be a bit, um, a bit puzzling. Uh, again, I suggest you take a look at the uh, MI200IS information uh, to, to get the background there. Anyway, so we're going to do three chains. I'm going to generate 10,000 iterations for each one, and I'm going to throw out the first 4,000 of each one of those as, as burn-in iterations. So that's why you see n chains, n iter, n burn-in. And I'm going to thin them out, so I'm only going to keep every fifth one of them. And that's what this n thin is. And then finally, this is where, uh, where the work occurs. Uh, this function bugs is part of the r to win bugs package. Uh, and we're going to be running out of time soon, so I'm not going to go through the help file on that. But I would recommend that you go ahead and pull up the help file for the r to win bugs package and take a look at the bugs function in particular. Uh, it, it'll give you some idea what some of these, uh, uh, some of the arguments are in here. Uh, but this, what this function is doing is you pass it the data. So we've constructed that data set. You pass in that function that generates the initial estimates. Uh, this here uh, is where we pass in the names of the parameters we want to monitor. We tell it where the model is defined. In particular, we're telling it <coughs> the name of the file that contains the model. And we, then we tell it things like the number of chains, number of iterations, number of burn-in samples, how much thinning in here uh, and then there's a few other bits things like you know where where is bugs located uh, what working directory are you in and all of these wine related things again you could ignore if you're not working on a on a unix flavor environment um, let's see what else oh some things i do want to tell you about because you may want to change them are these two uh, this clear wd and debug uh, clear WD is a logical indicating whether or not uh, this, whether or not our WinBugs should delete uh, the files it generated 
after it's done. So it generates a script file, it generates a data file, and some initial estimate files. And if you say clear WD equals true, it'll delete those when it's done. If you'd like to retain them, usually for debugging purposes, uh, specify false for that. In fact, usually while I'm doing my initial work with a model, I usually specify that as false. Uh, and then this debug uh, argument here, uh, whether it's true or false, it just indicates whether or not WinBugs closes at the when it's done or whether it stays open. So when debug equals false, it closes when it's done and returns control to R. If debug is is true, then what happens is it leaves WinBugs open so that you can go in and interact with it uh, when it's done. Uh, so, and it, so it does not return control to R until you manually close bugs. Again, so I would change that one to true if I'm in uh, the early stages of development where I'm, where there's a good chance I might res it might result in an error. Uh, and that gives you the ability to do some manual debugging right from within WinBugs. Uh, let's see, I got a question here about can I miss some options if they're default? And I had just looked over now, so hopefully that was regarding the, the bugs function. Uh, yeah, I mean, in cases where they are defaults, and I, again, I'd recommend you look at the help file to see what are defaults and what are not. So, for example, if you're working in a Windows environment, the defaults for all of these things, use wine, wine, all of those, would be appropriate for a Windows environment, and you could delete those and without, without it being any problem. On the other hand, leaving them here doesn't hurt either. Uh, so, I... You know, again, the key there is to get familiar with the definitions of the various arguments and what the and what which of them have defaults and whether those defaults are appropriate for your case. Uh, okay, so that would run the wind bugs, uh, and then there's some stuff going on down below that where uh, this function here, save model, is actually defined in the bugs tools uh, collection. And basically what it does is it creates another directory inside the example directory uh, that will contain all your results and it saves this, it saves the MCMC chains to that. Uh, and, then, and then some of the subsequent things in here, let's see, this here, the Sims array and posterior thing are just taking the results of bugs fit and putting in a particular format uh, uh, to be suitable for some of the subsequent code here. Uh, then down here we've got things like, oops, too fast, um, opening up a graphics file where uh, our graphics device here, which is where the plots are going to go. Uh, this thing here, uh, down here, uh, this p table, it says, you know, is parameter plot table. Again, that's another function in the bugs tools group that will create a nice summary table of the results. And the right CSV statement here is just writing that to a file in the form of a CSV delimited uh, file. And then I generate some uh, posterior prediction plots in here. So that's all of the core components. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look and see what this does. Uh, let me just go ahead and select the whole mess uh, and run it. does take a little bit. Uh, you'll see there's a few uh, sort of error and warning messages that come up. Fortunately for this particular example, they fall under the heading of benign warnings uh, that uh, are not serious errors, so you can pretty much ignore them in this instance. Uh, what you see that what it does is it's launched WinBugs. Uh, so WinBugs is opened up, it's running. Uh, you can see inside the log sort of the state that it's in. Uh, so you can see it's gone through, it's done all the usual bits here, and it's now updating. Actually, what it's doing now, it's doing an initial update for the burn-in phase. Uh, if you like, you can actually interact uh, with it while it's going. You can go up and uh, click, for instance, I can click up here. Let's see, it takes a little bit to respond uh, on the pull-down menus. Uh, I can click on update here. In a minute, it'll come up with a 
uh, it'll come up with a little window where you can see what's going on. You can actually see the status here. So I can see, okay, it's done 700 iterations so far. That's just done the 800th one. And notice when the 800 was over, it's now set some monitors. In other words, what setting monitors means is it means it's now saving the values of these quantities uh, following each iteration, or since we're thinning it here by five, it will save them after every fifth. Uh, so it's saving every fifth value of theta, PAE, AE pred, and deviance. Uh, so it'll be actually saving those so you can process them later on. Uh, and it's again, yeah, it's going, still going on its merry way here. Uh, let's see. Got another question here. Let's take a look. It says, is the interaction only limited to observation? Um, oh, okay. Uh, I think I know what you mean. Uh, no, you can change things. You probably, there most things you probably don't want to, uh, but I actually could alter the run uh, in various ways. So pretty much anything up here that isn't grayed out uh, when you look at it, uh, you know, you could conceivably alter things. For instance, if I actually hit the update button, that will actually abort the run. Uh, or actually what it does is update, the update button acts like a toggle. Uh, what it does is it stops the updating process. Um, so what will happen is it, if I do that, it'll move on to whatever the next steps are in the script that's running this. Uh, so it will usually end up forcing the thing to go to completion. But anyway, there's, you, there are other ways you could interact with it. It's just I would say do, this, do so judiciously. Okay, it looks like it's crunching here. Let's see. You can kind of see the status here over in the console. It's, uh, you can see it's finished running. It's saving the model. Uh, again, there's a bunch of error messages that are benign error messages that are ignorable in this case, and it's finished. Uh, let's take a look at what it gave us. Now, you don't actually see much in R other than the fact it's just iterating the things it went through, but if we go to the directory, you'll see there's a new folder, uh, binary uh, example. Uh, in addition, the, um, that expl the exploratory plots I mentioned show up as a PDF file in the main directory here. Uh, but the key in terms of the, the actual WinBugs results, they're inside this other folder. Uh, and you've got various things. So for example, we have uh, this binary example dot summary CSV. If I open that up, And hopefully it will here, come on. Okay, let's see if it's hidden behind again. It is. Okay, it looks like it'll finish okay. Uh, let me go ahead and see. Yeah, I guess with that it's pretty good shape. So this is uh, gives you then a picture of the summary uh, that it generates. So for example, you can see on the first column, you see a listing of the, the parameters and quantities here. Uh, by the way, we, I'm not going to talk in detail now, but in case you haven't encountered deviance, deviance is, uh, is minus two times the log of the likelihood. Uh, and so, and in the case of a Bayesian analysis, that's actually a distribution of values. Uh, so this is summarizing the posterior distribution of that deviance. Uh, but then you have all of our thetas. So you've got theta one was the intercept, two was the slope on dose. Uh, and if I remember these right, I believe they were age, weight, and gender uh, were what the other three were associated with in that order. So you can see their values. So these are the posterior means or an estimate of the posterior means, posterior standard deviation. Uh, the naive standard error is nothing more than taking this standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the number of MCMC uh, -MC iterations. Uh, the time series SE is an attempt to adjust for the correlation uh, in the MCMC -MC samples to give you an estimate of what the standard is, uh, or error is given that, and generally, and these values will usually be larger than, than the naive standard error. 
Uh, then we get some uh, quantiles from the posterior distribution. So for example, let's say for, uh, for oh, let's take for dose. So for dose, that's theta two. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, two and a half and the 97 and a half percentile, we go from uh, 0.09 roughly to uh, 0.14. So that then tells you something about the 95% credible interval uh, for that parameter. Uh, if you want to make inferences about things like the influence of, let's see, what was the next one, age, you can see the 90, if you look across here, uh, that the values are all positive. Uh, in particular, going all over the entire, uh, going from the 2.5 to the 97.5, percentile, uh, it never crosses the um, uh, crosses zero, indicating there's pretty strong, uh, pretty strong inference here than the pretty high probability that age does have some influence on the result. Uh, if you look down at the last one, gender, the same thing is true. In this case, they're all negative, but it doesn't include zero. And then finally for uh, weight, uh, it's more ambiguous here because you can see the two and a half percentile somewhere between the 75th and the 97 and a half percentile is zero. So that one is not quite as strong a probability that it, uh, that it has an influence. Uh, and then we get various plots. So if we grab, um, let's just go ahead and do a quick opening on these. Okay. Okay, guys, it went right off the screen there. That's not what I want. Let's see if I can get this where I can actually. See. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. Let's go. Maybe window will take me where I want to go. Okay, let's take a look at one, okay? Uh, okay, let's pass on that. Uh, here we've got our history plots. So they all look like pretty nice fuzzy caterpillars. So I'm pretty happy with that. Also, all three of the, um, you know, all, all three chains, which are indicated by different colors, are pretty well intertwined with each other. So there appears to be no convergence problems. It also looks like we've got enough samples to, uh, uh, to, to support our estimates. Uh, what's two here, two? There's your marginal densities for each of the parameters. So again, you can make inferences about values uh, sort of graphically from that. Uh, what did I get? Oh, this is a gelman rubin brooks plot. This is another metric for looking at uh, convergence. You're looking for these things to converge to values that are around one. Uh, these are all, you know, actually pretty low values. These are so certainly no convergence problems indicated there. And I think this will be a predictive plot. Yeah, here we're looking at posterior predictions for the fraction of patients with adverse events versus dose uh, overlaid with the observed values. So again, you're, and you're looking at medians and 90% credible intervals uh, for each one, of the, uh, each one of the dose levels here, again, for male and female patients. Close this guy. Uh, also, I guess I'll mention this R save file here. Uh, that's a that's created using the R save command, which is a binary format uh, saving <coughs> all of the MCMC results. And the way I, the reason I do that is if I later on come back and I want to do. Uh, some more analyses of the posterior samples, but I don't want to rerun wind bugs. I can simply reconstitute uh, that file, uh, the object from that file. And I have a question here that are three chains a gold standard for both exploratory and production runs? I don't know that it's a gold standard. It's a common default. Uh, I, sh I know myself I should probably examine it more carefully than I often do, but it, it does tend to be, uh, it, it, I would argue it's probably a minimum for, 
for convergence diagnostics, uh, but I'm not sure I'd want to call it really a gold standard uh, for the, and making a distinction between exploratory and production runs. If you know you you know if you know from past experience that you've got particularly good uh, convergence properties, uh, you know you could probably argue that doing just getting by with one chain is enough. You know, so you could, I could imagine reducing the number of chains when I go from exploratory to production runs. Um, uh, probably not the reverse, though, because during the exploratory runs, I probably want to understand what the convergence properties are. So that's a, an incomplete and probably too long-winded answer for that degree of incompleteness, but that's to give you some loose idea. Also, you may want to make decisions based upon the kind of computation environment you're in. Uh, you can, If you're working in a parallel computing environment where you have access to a lot of compute nodes. It may be advantageous to act, to use more chains which are running on separate machines. You know, so as opposed to using one machine that has you know only one or two processors uh, available to you, where uh, you may be better off using a single chain, you know, or a smaller number of chains. So so that might be part of the reason for choosing the number of chains. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to tell you about that? Let me actually take a quick peek at the, the notes I had here to see what I've missed here. Because I wanted to walk through the model in the R script. Um, let's see, talked about clear WD and debug. Okay, we're not going to have time to show you how to run manually for debugging. Maybe we can do that next week uh, to illustrate that because I find it's useful for students to basically see me make a mistake and then uh, and then try to resolve it using doing some manual runs with uh, with winbug so perhaps uh, during the next lab session we can do that uh, let's see it might be worth uh, you might want to take a, do this run yourself uh, and also take a look at some of these so in fact I'll make a suggestion to you uh, let me go back to the R uh, the suggestion to you is actually to, um, besides running it, uh, when you run it, uh, let me scroll down to where I want to get here. There we go. Uh, go ahead and change clear WD uh, to, to false. You might also, just to explore, go ahead and change debug equals true just to explore the behavior so you understand it. Uh, but in particular, do clear WD equals false and actually take a look at what kind of file structures you get out of that. Uh, it's also instructive to see what kind of a script it creates uh, for, for running wind bugs. Uh, but any, but uh, that, that'll give you some, some ideas on what's happening under the hood here. Uh, but again, I'll, um, I'll try and remember for the next lab session to give you a, some idea how you can take advantage of those files in cases where you do encounter, uh, you know, encounter bugs or, or some other error uh, when you're working with this. I think, uh, let's see, I'll take a quick breath here to see if there's any final questions and uh, plan on signing off and, until next Monday. So. Uh, Anyway, any, any last questions? Okay, so far I'm not, oh, there's one, oh, I've got a no, okay, other than that, so. Um, okay, I'll assume they're not. Again, uh, if you do have questions in the meantime, uh, go ahead and send them through the through our Q&A forums, and I will try and get to them as, as soon as I can if they come that way. 
Uh, and uh, thank you again for joining me, and I'll talk to you again on, what is it, Monday, I guess. Okay, bye for now.